audio. Sometimes it won't get the the video. So I just went ahead and got screen flow. I need it anyway. All right. This is how I do it. I'll do the presentation first. If you have a question, you can put your question in here and I'll answer it after the, uh, the webinar. So with that, we will get started. All right, my name is Glendon Cameron, and this webinar is about old school sourcing. No thrift stores needed. This is what I used to do when we ran into the droughts. When, for some reason, it just happened with storage auctions. There would just be a period of time. There was nothing out there. I mean, it was just really, really strange. Sometimes it would be a week or two. Most times it would be a week or two. But there was an extended period that scared me. It really did because it was about eight weeks, two months. And this wasn't tax season. It was just there was nothing out there. Our customer base was built. We had to have products. So I had to come up with other ways to get a lot of product. This will be based on volume. This isn't like onesies and twosies. This is stuff that I used to do to get a truckload of furniture or inventory or something. So with that, let's jump into it. Anything that sells once usually will sell again. Many people become blindsided by the Ducati. Everyone's like, I want the nice stuff. I want the good stuff. I want the really, really nice. Give me the nice stuff. With little regard to something as simple as a collection of books that may be in your house that could sell for good coin. Broaden your horizons to what inventory is. Inventory can be if you're sitting at your desk, anything on your desk could be inventory. It just really, really depends on what your business goals are. And, you know, this is more into you must change your concept of product because this old phone, I bought a unit full of old phones, uh, old telephones, uh, not, let's say telephone booths, I'm sorry. I did not know that there was a demand for those things. I was kind of pissed because unless you're, you know, there's people who've never seen the telephone booth. We're like 20 some years old. They've never seen one. But there was demand. Uh, people use them for props and stuff. So being in the storage auction business seriously expanded my concept of what product was. I was in the office furniture business and I sold new furniture. So, you know, product to me was something that came from a distribution center. You went there, you got it and you sold it. I didn't know product was record players. I didn't know product was handles that went on pots. I didn't know that lids like Lee Crochet is. So there's a lot of things that you can sell that, you know, go into my video on YouTube. It doesn't have to be sexy to sell, but it can make you a lot of money. This is the thing that many people fail to do sell what you know if you have a hobby start from there and if you ascertain that your hobby isn't profitable then you move on but if you're an artist there's inherent knowledge that you have on things that are very expensive because i was i used to be an artist in my former life commercial art clay visual arts oil paintings i used to do all that and if you're an artist you know that quality painting supplies are expensive. Many people want to become artists, right? And they're like, oh, they'll go out and get the canvas. They'll get the oils and they'll go through this phase and then they won't do anything with it. You can put an ad on Craigslist looking for art supplies, just like, hey, I buy used art supplies for my kindergarten class or I buy art supplies for my church group. And get the stuff a little enough and you will be amazed at what a tube of oil paint can go for. It is not a cheap preoccupation. Also, say you're a car enthusiast. Say you love Mustangs. You can make a comfortable living selling nothing but Mustang parts. Just find a Mustang somewhere in your city. Part it out. Put the pieces on eBay. Sell what you know. That's what I came onto YouTube with was selling the storage auction information because that's what I knew and the furniture and that's what I knew. And now I'm selling something different because the last four and a half years I've learned something different. So you can sell what you know and there's some things that you want to learn about. 
you can go on a crash course for, say, take 90 days and I'm going to learn everything I can about this topic, this items, these things. 90 days of concentrated study could make you an expert. Seriously could. There's a guy by the name of Lewis Howes. He was laid up with an injury. He, he tried to play football professionally and or amateurly. Six months, he just spent a lot of time learning how LinkedIn worked. Wrote a book about it. Felt, you know, networked with other people and created several products and he makes seven figures a year from something he knew nothing about originally, but now he knows. So don't be intimidated if there's something you want to know about, but create a list of everything that you know about. Is it Beanie Babies, cookware, cars, furniture, drapes, baby clothes, whatever you have a substantial knowledge base on, go into the marketplaces and see if that stuff is selling and sell that. It's going to be easier for you because your learning curve will not be as steep. And once you get that going, go out and find some other stuff that you don't know about, because this is my recommendation to you. Go ahead, create an income stream for something that you know. You may not like it. You may not want to do it. But the whole thing is to create the income stream with this stuff. And when you have the money coming in, that gives you options to do other things. So definitely sell what you know. Develop a plan. You, you have to have a plan. As I said before, there's um, two groups of hustlers. The get money hustler, a.k.a. the opportunistic hustler, or the strategic hustler. Strategic hustler is someone that sat down and said, I am going to take an inventory of what I want to do, what are my skill sets, my capital base. And I'm going to create a plan. And part of that plan is an income goal. It can be whack the first few times you do it because you don't have numbers. But once you start selling, you, you'll get a better feel for what your numbers should be. I put this desk up to show you because I often talk about I bought a unit full of mid-century's desk. That's the desk that I, I got. Some had legs like that and some had the fat boy legs. Those things were selling for 950 to 1500 bucks, just the way they were. Because to find them in good condition was rare. So bring me to the next thing. Volume. Many, many people are stuck on onesies and twosies and threesies. And I'll go get something and I'll sell it. I'll go get something else and I'll sell it. You've got to create a three-tiered plan where you have enough capital to run your business, buy stuff, and some holdback capital to take advantage of opportunities. Now, I put a house up there for obvious reason. Well, maybe not so obvious. Everything that you're looking at on that house, I've sold. And you're looking at shingles. Yes, you're looking at woodwork. Yes, you're looking at ceiling fans. Yes, you're looking at windows, fences, doors. All that stuff that you see in that picture, I've gotten out of storage units. Now, a lot of it was new, which makes it an easier sell. But people buy old windows, people buy old doors, people buy all kinds of stuff. Now, if you want to make a livable income, you're going to need volume. You're definitely going to need volume. And that's why I say buy the house. Start thinking of how can you get 100 pieces a week of a particular product or 100 pieces a week of particular products. Because the thing is, if you can get your hands on 100 items every week, whether it's clothing, furniture, jewelry, gold coins, whatever, 100 pieces every week, that's 400 pieces. Say you're using eBay. A typical eBay sell-through rate when I was doing it, it could be better, it could be worse. I'm just going to give you a number for this illustration. It's 20%. So you've got 400 items per month. You're selling 80. Say so you're selling them for 20 bucks a piece. Profit. 20 bucks a piece net profit. That's $1,600. It's almost $20,000 a year. Just on that. And that's at a $20 net profit base. You could do better. You can do higher. There'll be flux. But the thing is, you got to get to the point of handling volume. My recommendation in this one is, if you're doing eBay... And Amazon, you really need to split it up. 
eBay has a valet program where they sell the stuff for you. I know the percentage seems high, but you don't have to ship it. You don't have to find a box for it. There's a lot of things you don't have to deal with. If you're going to sell on eBay, use the valet service. Two, you sell on Amazon, use Amazon FBA. Let me be really, really clear. I am not saying abandon what you're doing for your own personal platform. I'm not saying that at all. What I'm saying is you want to use the efficiency of these platforms and their tools for your benefit to give you more time to build your thing. That's what I'm saying. I'm not, don't ever, 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 ever lose track of what you want to do. You want to have your own thing somewhere. You want to have your own products. You want to have your own website. You, you really want to do that because the thing is, everyone talks about this. Hey, Glendon, it took a long time, man, to build up some traffic to a website and there's nobody there. Everybody's at eBay and they all over there on Amazon. Why am I going to take the time to and the effort and the money to build my own website when I can use these other platforms? And I told that person, that's an excellent question. And I was like, do you expect to live for the next 10 years? Yeah. Do you expect to live for the next 20 years? Yeah. Do you expect to live for the next 30 years? Yeah. If it takes your website 10 years to catch fire and you just told me that you expect to live for another 30 years, you've got 20 years of easy peasy money. Yeah. The, the whole thing is think long term. Do this short term hustle to get immediate cash, you know, whatever you have to do, but still have a strategic long term plan for generating money. I don't care if it's hustling. I don't care if it's selling houses. I don't care if it's selling bricks. I don't care if it's selling baby pacifiers. Have some kind of long range plan, because the thing is, in this new disruptive economy, you have to manage a lot of different stuff now. So if you're managing a lot of different stuff. You want to have as many tools of efficiency working for you. The Amazon FBA. And, you know, I've heard people say, why would I use Amazon FBA? I ship my own stuff. I don't need them. And work yourself down to the nub. This is what's happening. Amazon, eBay, they've made it very treacherous for a seller that you don't get too many error passes you know you do something wrong okay fine it happens but if you get too many negative comments too many bad ratings they limit you or just kick you off the site whereas if you're doing that and you're doing it well working on ebay and amazon but you're still over here building your site learning seo doing all this other stuff right if that happens you're more prepared because you were working on your own thing and I know that, you know, this is supposed to be about sourcing, but this is part of the plan, because if you're going to go out there and source, you need a long term plan. What are you looking for? How are you going to fit this? Because the thing is, you go out there and just like do opportunistic hustling all the time. You develop a habit of not planning for the long term and it can kill you in this new economy. Now, I want to change your mind. Because the thing is, you hear all this stuff about, you know, sourcing product and people think it's rocket science. It's not rocket science. Sourcing product today is rocket science in this current environment because of the transparency of online retail. If you have a product, someone can do a script on your website, figure out how many people went to that page figure out your page rank, fill out if you're selling this stuff. Amazon is very good at this. And before you know it, all these other people are selling your product because of the transparency of the Internet and the immediacy of gaining information. So you got to have a plan and you've got to have some stuff that's kind of hard to source. That's why, you know, uh, in the Hustle University, when we start talking about product creation, we're going to be talking about, you know, making your own labels, private label stuff, buying straight from a distributor, uh, little tricks like when you buy your stuff, you take it out of the boxes that it came in and you repackage it and you'll send it to Amazon FBA. They can't buy it if they don't know where you got it from. They may like, OK, this is selling well, but they don't know your margins. 
Many people only set out to source in the hot stuff, like the bolos and all this other stuff. Don't get caught up like that. Once again, you're managing different tracks. If you got this track, we're going to do the hot stuff. Okay, make that 25, 30 percent of your business. Or, you know, as a Mason say, a 33 and a third. Then 33 and a third on something else, 33 and a third on something else. Because when we got the big bitch slap from eBay, if we didn't have Craigslist, our warehouse and other things we were doing, we would have been out of business. We would have been completely and utterly out of business. So understand in this managing of stuff, start opening up your mind to the possibilities of selling more than what you're selling. Because so many things sell. I, I mean, I'm looking at my desk. There's a microphone. There's a camera. There's some hats. There's a lamp. There's a uh, external hard drive. Tons of stuff. There's some, uh, you know, external battery chargers. Like you know, for your iPhone, you just got this thing you carry around with you, and you plug it in and it gives you a little juice. I have a lot of stuff on my table that will sell. Stapler, not for much. Battery charger. Start thinking like that because you're gonna have some stuff. That's going to be low margin when you when you start selling this stuff. But you just kind of mix it in. Like, if your low margin stuff has a high enough sales rank for Amazon or eBay, just send it to the Amazon FBA. Just send it to eBay Valet. And send a lot of it. And let them do the heavy lifting and the packing and all this other stuff. Just do that. Because really, the big deal about sourcing is about cost and markup. I don't care how well you source stuff. If the markup's wrong, you're not going to make good money or you may lose money. So that's the most important thing. Now, I'm going to give you a few of my little secrets. Craigslist was my bitch selling and buying all day long. I have this uh, up here for a reason. It is the auto parts section of Craigslist. A lot of people ignore this because it's a guy section. If you spend a lot of time here, you'll find deals. For my old BMW, I had a 1994 525i, I used to call him Thor before he died. Yes, he died. We we, we said a eulogy, and but he's okay. But Thor needed some new shoes one day. And I was looking at the tires that were going for the car, and they were like 210, 220 a piece. Just for the tires. And I really didn't like those tires because they, they just weren't, they didn't like the ride. I was like, I'm not going to get those. So I go to my friend Craigslist and I start looking. And I don't find it on day one. I don't find it on day two. It actually took me about four weeks to come across this deal. There's a guy up in Marietta. He had four BMW, BBS, mesh rims and tires. And the tires still had the titties on them when I saw him in the picture. And he was asking three seventy five. And I said, hmm, hmm. So I called him and we, we really didn't connect. And I eventually got to him about two days later. I go up there. He's dragging tires from behind his house. Tires are fine. So I haggled him down to 300 bucks. I then go literally two miles away to this place, this tire shop. And I had them place the tires on my vehicle. The tires were balanced. Not dry rot, perfectly fine. Threw my tires and rims in the trunk in the back seat. Put them on Craigslist and sold them for $150. So if you're doing the math, I got brand new tires with the titties still on it. Brand new rims, 17-inch rims, mesh, for $150. Now, as Paul Harvey says, I'm going to give you the rest of the story. He didn't say it like that, but I'm going to give, you know, because normally he says that's the rest of the story. When I sold Thor... I took the shoes off and I sold them for $450. So I made a $300 profit on the rims and used tires two and a half years after the fact. That is the power of Craigslist. If you know what you're looking for, you have knowledge to what it is, and you're willing to be consistent with your search. You can do this stuff for profit all day long. Now, we're going to do a special automation webinar because I got some stuff that's coming. I'm just going to let y'all know. Since y'all are family, uh, today I went out and talked to a distributor for some of the stuff that I'm going to send to Amazon FBA. Um, my daughter is coming to live with me, and one of her christening gifts is we're going to start a corporation and all this other stuff. And I went out and, you know, 
I'm, I was already signed up with the company. I just had to make sure what they were doing to get a price sheet because what I'm going to teach you to do with Amazon FBA is to go out and find your own products. I know retail arbitrage is great. Going to thrift stores is great. But if you can find two products that sell to the tune of 100 items per month and you make $30 from those products and you can get them frequently, to me, that is better than going thrifting around in thrift stores. And, you know, because the people who do retail arbitrage work very, very hard. The ones that are successful work very, very, very hard. Going back to my personal goals of what I want for my life and my family, freedom. So for me to do Amazon FBA the way that other people are doing it, because, you know, unless you're going to get some new stuff, it's very hard to automate getting the used stuff because you physically have to go out, physically have to scan, physically have to go to websites and look this stuff up. But if you can find some items, you know, anywhere from two to 30 items that you can get brand new, and ship it's just to me a better concept of the whole thing so that's just you know that's coming that's coming the automation uh deal and the new product things to amazon now this is a one of the lies i used to tell that wasn't really a lie i started in a safe bio company called prime river and i had a little fancy logo and everything and I would just put it up on there. It's like, hey, you know, we'll do your estate sales. Or if you really, really don't want to have an estate sale, we may buy everything for our own liquidation process. Met with most people. Most people wanted to have an estate sale. I would uh, form that out and refer it to someone and get a little cash on the back end. And I would get one or two a month that would sell me everything they were going to have for their estate sale. They didn't want to have an estate sale. Uh, usually these were very sad events. You have to have a certain level of compassion because granddad, grandma, someone passed on and they're getting rid of those memories. So it's pretty rough. But the most I've ever spent on one house and it was a four bedroom house, I spent five grand. Uh, typically, I was getting this stuff for anywhere from uh, 800 bucks to 1500 bucks. I'm talking about house full of stuff because this is how I would do it. I would say it and it's all about your presentation. I would go in. And it's like, hey, I'm Glendon, Prime River. This is what we do. And I would pick 40 or 50 things. And it's like, well, I'm interested in this, but I'm not interested in all that small stuff. So we work a deal and I give them a price for the big stuff because I already know what's coming next. Well, since you got to come back, um, tell you what, give me 50 bucks and you can have all that small shit, too. <laughs> and I often made more money on the small stuff. Because you have to understand the psychology. When you go in there and you get the big stuff, they know that a lot of people are not going to come to the estate sale for the small stuff, except for real hustlers. The real hustlers will show up, rain, shine, snow, don't care. They're showing up because sometimes I got incredible deals for just simply showing up. I wasn't brilliant. I wasn't the smartest knife in the drawer. I just showed up. So by creating a buyout company and running an ad on Craigslist and you have to run that consistently because the thing is if you run it because the first three months were kind of like buckets you know I get a few bites but people who had saw the ad was consistent it's like yeah I saw your ad a few weeks ago and you know we have a situation so you have to look at this long-term marketing for this thing to work and understand that most people would be disappointed with you because you're not trying to hold the estate sale you're trying to get in there first you want first crack at everything and you can get some serious deals because when they see that they're going to get you know 1500 3000 5000 that's a lot of cash now if you're dealing with an informed seller that knows that oh you're going to give them 5000 but everything in the house is worth 40 you might have some problems but buyer beware seller beware but that was a very nifty way that i got a lot of product during those lean years I know it sounds strange, 2014, but ads in the newspaper still work for a certain demographic. And the cool thing is, a lot of times you can get it free by going to their online version. Sometimes they'll let you list it for themselves. Because there are certain people who still, for some reason, go to 
the newspapers to look stuff up. I know it sounds crazy, but they do. Cracks me up, but they do. So that's another thing for you to think about. Now, this is some stuff that I did not do, but I know about it. And I have uh, done it on Facebook. This is how to make your Facebook group work. Create your own. Create your own and you bring people in. You be the organizer. You be the originator. That is how you will make your group pop. Because the thing is, when you join someone else's group, you can sell stuff. But if you start it and you kind of steer the direction of the group, kind of groom it uh, to a certain way, you can change the complexion of the group. Like say, do a Facebook group, use furniture Facebook group. That's all you do is use furniture, nothing else. That's going to populate very well in Google. When you're just doing shotgun stuff and everything, it may still pop up in Google, but a strong theme really works well. <laughs> and the door to door still works. Now, this is more for business inventory. I worked in, you know, I had a warehouse and we were in an industrial complex. If you are going to, if you're looking for certain things, you knock door to door and say, look, uh, the, you know, I'm just going to use aluminum cans or no, I'm, I'm going to use phone systems. Go door to door and say, hey, do you have any used phone systems that you don't want? We're paying cash today. You may knock on 30 doors. Now, this is the thing that I've noticed when you go door to door and you're looking to buy something, you're more well received. <laughs> you know, it's not like, no, nah, we don't want. Oh, you want to buy something? So just pick an industrial complex with a certain item that you want that you sure they may have on um, small businesses going to have phone systems. They're going to have used computers. They're going to have office furniture, they're gonna have office chairs. Just depending. And then you may come across a business. And this is another tip that I should tell you. There's something called wholesale on top of wholesale. That's how I got my bedroom set on the Paramart. Uh, my bedroom set was fifteen hundred bucks for two nightstands, king size platform bed, dresser and mirror. Wholesale on that deal a few years ago was thirty two hundred bucks and they were selling in the finer stores for sixty five hundred. They discontinued it. And I want you to remember this. A lot of times when a company discontinues something, they just blow it out. Just blow it out. And it's still new. It still works. And you can get that stuff even cheaper than wholesale. But still sell it close to retail price or sometimes if it's something that people want, even more. So start thinking of business inventory. Start thinking of, I mean, once again, going back to the beginning, open your mind to what product is. You could go to, say, there was a place, uh, my, my warehouse used to be on the Mountain Industrial in Tucker. There was this place that was selling batteries. They went out of business, and they just was blowing out batteries. I went in there one day. I saw a guy. He was a flea market guy. I could tell. He walked out with a pallet of brand new batteries for 50 bucks. Yes, a pallet about three to four feet high of brand new batteries for 50 bucks. He could sell those things for five bucks a pack and make a lot of money. I don't know what he was selling for, but these are brand new batteries. So you got to look for those sales. Uh, the desk that I'm using in my office, I got from a business moved and they were selling all kinds of stuff. They had iPads, like 100 iPads for 150 bucks. That was the first things to go. Um, that's the kind of stuff you're looking for. Big stuff, volume stuff, new stuff. But going door to door still works if you're trying to buy. Now, let's just get down to the nitty gritty. You've seen all this stuff on YouTube and people like flipping from a dollar. The number of people that can support themselves, run a business and work 20, 30, 40 hours a week and also have another job that's supporting the bills. Take all of that money from that new business and reinvest it over and over again until it gets to a certain amount is rare. It's rare. Everyone's not going to reinvest that money and just keep flipping it and flipping it and flipping it because you got a business. You got a job. You got your business flipped up to like 20000 a month. The transmission in your car goes out. 
is four grand. What are you going to do? You're pulling the money out of the business because you got it, which means you, you, you have to start over. So I'm going to give you a different strategy. And some people may disagree. Uh, other people may agree. You need $5,000 to $20,000 war chest, preferably cash. If you don't have cash, if you got a credit card, let me tell you how to do this. You can use your credit card. Now, this is what you do. There's a lot of deals out there. I can tell you Discover is offering 14 months interest free for the first 14 months. So what you do, if you don't have one, is you get one of those credit cards, which gives you time to use the money as capital. And also, you're not paying the interest monster. But no, the interest monster will kick in if you do not pay the balance in those 14 months. But take this card and only use it for things that you know you're going to sell. This is not money that you would just gamble like, I got a hunch. Yeah. No, 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 no. This would be like, say you found a widget and you know this widget absolutely positively sells on Amazon for $30. And you have a chance to get... 200 of them for 10 bucks or five bucks. That's a go. You did your research. You know it's selling. You know what you're looking at. You know you're getting the deal. You use that money for that type of stuff. No speculating. No, I'm going to ball that. No, none of that stuff. It is strictly for sure bets and use your cash for the other stuff. Because the thing is that 5,000 bucks is not your money. It's credit. And it has to be paid back. But credit used properly can grow your business much faster than flipping. You can get to the same point in 90 days with credit card use that someone may take a year or two to flip up to. And I know that it's like, you know, um, no debt. I don't know anybody. It sounds good. But the f fact of life is. Most of this country was built on credit. I'm not saying get to the point where you're like eyeballs deep in debt, but use your good credit on good buys. That's what you can use it for. Things you know you can flip. And also, if you're going to do this, get yourself a good rewards card. American Express, uh, Chase Sapphire is good. If you're going to be flipping a lot of money on that card, make sure you're getting rewards because you can get two or three trips out the year. You, It's just the hustler mindset. You're already doing it. Why not get all the benefit that you can? But to really play this game correctly, you're going to need some money. You're going to need access to capital. You're going to need access to funds because if you could come out with, let's just leave it at 5000 and you get the right inventory at the right price and go to Amazon FBA. You might get that back plus some friends called uh, profit first 30 to 60 days if you're buying right and you're selling right or sooner. Whereas if you're trying to flip up to that, you're going to go through several different sales cycles. And what I mean by sales cycles is you have this product, right? And it's January and this product is selling for 50 bucks. Well, if it's selling well and other people going back to the transparency of the Internet, other people are looking at that. So by the time you flip up to get it, the selling price is 30. So you've missed out on a lot of profit because you were not in a position to buy when it was hot. So this is another thing that happens when you're trying to flip up or, you know, come up or parlay, as some people say. You need some money to play this game correctly. You really do. All right, that is that part of the session. And I am going to open up the floor to questions. What do we have here? This is from Javier. Hey, G, what do you think about those online auction houses that liquidate businesses like office furniture and equipment as a sourcing channel? I think they're awesome if you know the inventory very, very well. If you're just guessing or you're hoping and you don't know that business that well, it's kind of a crapshoot. Uh, online is great. But the thing is, I'll give you my experience with pallets in liquidation sales. Some of the stuff was online. Some of it was just a phone call. Sometimes you got a fact sheet and you would just buy the stuff sight unseen and it would come to you. 
There's something called compression damage. There's something called shipping damage. It may be fine when you see it, but if they ship it to you, a lot of things can happen. I, this is my preference, and people can disagree with me. I believe in sourcing as much of your inventory locally as possible, or if you're going to source online, it has to be a trusted source. I would have no problem buying furniture from Paoli because I know they're going to ship it right. They're going to ship it on their own truck. They're going to make it's not going to be jacked up, and the guys in their warehouse are going to know how to move it. But if someone had some Paoli desk and they were in just a Rudy Poot warehouse, I wouldn't buy it because the chances of it leaving that warehouse and getting to me intact are kind of slim, kind of slim. So do your due diligence on those things. Get as much information as you can because everyone's like, hey, you know, I'm buying this liquidation stuff. I got six pallets in. Look at the margins. Look at the rewards. Look at the effort because. Someone gets a pallet and they say they made 10000 How much did they spend for the pallet? How much did they throw away? There's, there's a lot of stuff that goes with that. But once again, I'm a little different. I think, you know, creating your own products, sourcing your own products is just a better way. Oh, I, I get that. It's not pallets, but it's businesses going online. The thing is, how are you going to get the merchandise back to you? Is it a local online auction? Where, you know, you just bid online and you go with your trucks and pick it up. Okay. So do they offer you a preview where you can look at it before the bidding begins? Because if it's local, they should. So, all right. Yeah, that now that's a little different. Okay. When you asked that question, I thought you were talking about, here's an auction in California and you're in New York. Essentially, that's just an offshoot of a local auction leveraging the internet to get more bidders. That's totally different. If you can put your eyes on it, go by, touch it, see it, take notes, and then go home and bid later. Yeah, that's cool. Sure thing. Uh, any more questions? Because like I said, this this going to be a lot more information coming, so I'm not trying to make these too long. I'll stay here as long as people are asking questions. And this will be in Hustler U tomorrow. So I will hold on a second and there will be more sourcing stuff because when I get my inventory, I will just show you because just to give you a plan while I'm waiting on questions, uh, I got a daughter. She's 22 years old and I always said I was going to do this with my kids when they got a certain age was create a corporation for them. And I'm going to give you just a little theory on this. I go ahead and create a corporation for them at this age. Go ahead and create them a Roth IRA or a SEP, or even both. 20 years from now, when they're 42, and the corporation's still around, that's an incredibly powerful thing to have in your life. And there's, you know, there's so many things you can do. You can put money in it. You can set money in it. You can, there's so many things that you can do with a corporation when you have a plan. And this is part of my retirement plan, because initially I was just going to set it up in her name. But knowing how young people can be, I'm going to set it up where I'm 51% owner and she's 49. And at some point it'll be all hers, but that's just to keep her from doing anything crazy. Like marrying some dude and he's like, your dad's name ain't on the corporation. That's ours, baby. Ain't happening. Ain't happening. So we're going to talk about that. Like I said, 2014, there's a lot of stuff that's going to drop. A lot of stuff. Okay. Looks like that is all the questions. So with, oh. <laughs> okay, so with that, let's see. Oh, here's another one. Uh, I asked this question before, but you make a webinar about creating an ink or an LLC. That's coming up. I didn't want to just put it out before I did the other ones because I've kind of held back for a few reasons. Like, I, there's probably going to be two LLCs, one just for my stuff, and then that's going to be one with me and her, or we may do an ink. But I will uh, actually, whoa, there's more questions. I will actually um, talk about that. <laughs> you have a mess. Uh, what kind of stuff would you invest for yourself? Are you talking about inventory or for uh, retirement? Okay, for retirement. Um, I am not a stocks or silver or gold guy because this is, this is my thing. 
I looked at it. Now, I have gold from the safe and stuff. I, I've got some things. I'm not buying anymore because I look at, all right, say you, you amass a bunch of gold, right? A bunch of silver, and then things get really bad. You got to protect your silver. You're going to need guns. You're gonna. There's so many things that go into that. So my plan for the future, going back to with my daughter, is creating these co this company and just getting it to the point where it's always going and doing stuff. Uh, my retirement, I think, you know, like I said, I, I'm never going to retire, is to have five, six, seven sources of income. And out of those five or six or seven sources of income, I want three or four to be active companies churning out cash versus stocks and all this other stuff. Because if I set them up and I don't have to run them, it's like being retired. And that's the thing. In the future, you're going to be able to do this stuff and not have to be sitting there to make it happen. So I'm not into the stocks and the goals because that's kind of trendy. And if gold gets up to like, you know, 30,000 bucks an ounce, we've got a lot of problems. We're going to have a lot of problems. So I really don't hope gold goes that high. So that's it. But uh, there will definitely be some more information. OK, I want to just say thanks for everybody that came out. There will be more webinars in the middle of the day because I've noticed that the uh, number of participants seems to be higher in the day than at night. And I'm going to roll with that. And there'll still be a few, maybe one a week at night, but most will be in the day. All right. With that, I'd just like to say thanks for everybody coming out, sharing your time. And uh, I'll see you on the good side. Goodbye.